this. We've been, we need wisdom. Uh, you know, good homes aren't just given to us. I mean, good homes have to be built, right? I mean, good homes have to be, there, there's stuff that we got to do. We got to put the pieces together. Hey, Amen. We talked about how, you know what, we really don't know what we're doing. We have no idea. And we're all walking into seasons that we're learning, learning about how to, how to navigate, you know. And, and, and the thing is, I believe if, if, if we have the leading of the Spirit, if we have um, a, a, a little common sense and biblical framework, I believe our kids are going to turn out all right, all right. Now, I know it looks like right now they're going to become a mass murderer. Okay, I get that. <laughs> but but, but, but to, stay, to stay the course, all right? And, and, and the thing is, is that the way that you raise your kids, the way that I raise my kids, the, it, it could be a little different. Every kid's different. Every situation's different. But I believe we all share the same, share the same values, right? The same, uh, we're, we're kind of in the same river, Right, we're in the same river, but just how we're getting from A to B sometimes is a little different. But in parenting, there's seasons. And in Ecclesiastes chapter three, verse one, it says, "To everything there is a season," and we've been talking about that. If you want to go real quick to Psalms, Psalms one twenty-seven, and this we've been here over the last few weeks, but I want to go back here again and turn. Uh, we're going to talk today uh, and, and help those in this room that have adult children. And how do you parent in this season? Because we never stop being parents. We never stop being parents. Psalm 127, there in verse 3 and 4, says, Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. They're an inheritance. It's, it's something that's been given to us from God. Now, I think that brings lots of comfort to us. Because, listen, if God has given you a gift, He must know that you can take care of the gift. And ultimately, your kids don't even belong to you. They belong to God. So it's going to bring lots of comfort to us as we raise our children. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb, not the fruit of the womb, all right? The fruit of the womb is a reward. Children are a reward. They're not a hassle. They're not, uh, you know, a pain in the rear end. Uh, they are a reward to you and I. What if we would just have that type of mentality with our parenting? Right? Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. And we've been talking about those three R's, how it's we got to receive our kids as a gift. We have to raise our children in order to release our kids. Right? So we receive our kids as a gift, as a reward. We have to steward what's being given to us. We raise, we raise our kids up. And then we release our kids. That's the way it should be. Amen. So there's different parenting seasons. And we've been talking about uh, over the last weeks. The first season we talked about was the training season. And the training season is that 0 to 11 years old. All right. This is where uh, practice time, the drilling over and over and over and over. It's not potty teaching. It's potty training. Right. It's over and over. It's training over and over it's disciplining wrong behaviors, right? No, you're going to run stairs for that one, right? No, you're going to run the track. You're going, no, you got, you're, going to, you're going to run before practice today, right? It's, it's that. You, and, and they're learning about their coach. They're learning about you. You're learning about your kids in this season, right? You're setting examples, and we should be all the time. The next season we talked about was last week's season. was talking about the coaching season. And this is the season between the ages of 12 through 18. And this is where kids are really starting to get in the game of life, okay? They're becoming much more autonomous. They're becoming much more uh, independent. They're away from you a lot. They're away from you more and more and more. And we are no longer on the field as much. We are actually on the sidelines, right, uh, managing the game from the sidelines, right? We don't want to be parents that are running on, on the field all the time taking the ball, Right? That's what happens. I'm taking my ball and I'm going home. And that's what happens with our, I mean, I just told you that. There's recently about how um, uh, there was a mom that, uh, uh, that like is suing, like a, I can't remember where this is at. It was in the news. Uh, that suing the, the county board and the school system for, because her kid didn't make the soccer team. That's a woman or that's a woman that, that, needs, that, that needs to understand something. They're not helping their kid at all. They're not helping their kids. 
So this coaching season, we're, we're, we're developing, our kids are developing strong peer structures. And, and we need to start letting our kids make decisions. And we talked about that last week, about how we go and we, we learn to parent with love and we learn to parent with logic. Amen. So, so it's in that season, they're, we're starting to, 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 they're starting to make decisions and we're allowing them to make decisions and let them experience the consequences, whether good and bad. Now, this is the thing. If you and I are doing our job well, we are going to have a pink slip going to be given to us. We're never going to stop being parents, but the deal is, is that we are actually working ourselves out of a job. So let's talk today about the advisory season. Now, I'm, there's many people in this room that's raised great kids and would be more apt to talk about this than me, but I'm going to do it. The advisory season. Uh, this is really the releasing season. This is the season that we release. And I'm going to be honest with you, it's probably the most challenging season of parenting because you're relinquishing your control. I don't know. I don't know about you. I'm just going to be honest with you. I think the worst thing about being, I'm going to start crying. I think the worst thing about raising kids is, is seeing them being raised and them becoming old and leaving. You know, I mean, it's, you know, I look at my girls. You know, I look at my girls and I I'm, I'm look at them. And it was like yesterday they were, they were just babies, you know. And, but I can see where this can be one of the most challenging seasons for parenting. So all the training, all the coaching, has brought parents to this moment, a moment that you begin to release the arrow. Okay? You release the arrow. It's the first day on the job for your kids. It's the first day of college when you drop them off. It, it's the wedding day. It's the moving out on their own. Right? So let me just say this to you. When you think about hunting a second, guys, and, and, and girls, but probably the guys will get this. Uh, if you've ever shot something with your bow, uh, when you release the arrow, everything gets played to you in a second of time. Did I do that right? Did I do this right? Did I hit him the right way? Did, 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 this, did this happen? Did it hit the target? Did I, did I release wrong? Did, did, was they even really there? How far were they away? Was they really 25 yards or were they really 50 yards? I mean, all this stuff in a moment's time starts coming back to you. It's the same thing with parenting, is that when we release our kids and we're going to be releasing our kids, it's in that moment the what ifs start more than ever. The what ifs. But I, I, I've been telling you this time and time and time again, there is no perfect parents, okay? And I want you to know something today, and this is for any season. The Father makes up for us. That's how good God is. He, this is not a, a, a trying to alleviate or take responsibility away from us as parents. We do the best job we can. But I want you to know something today, that no matter what, God has always got your back. And God is always, he's, he's going he's to let you fail. He's not going to let you fail. He's got your back. And, and this is, helps us. Because in these moments, these what-if moments, that we have to trust God with our arrows. We have to trust God with our arrows. You've got to trust God that you've done what needed to be done. And even if you failed or you've messed up or maybe you was late getting in the game or whatever, quit living in guilt and condemnation. Quit doing all of that and believe God's got your back. Amen. We're going to talk about some of that today. I want to show you a couple of scriptures real quick over on the screen. Psalms, uh, Psalms. Uh, 37 verse 23 and 24 just talking about how good God is the Lord directs the steps of the godly he delights in every detail of their life stop right there a second it says he delights in every detail of your life God loves he, he's, he's in part of every detail He's, he's involved in every detail of our lives. He delights in every detail. I love that. He delights in every detail of my life. He delights in every part of my life. He's so good. Amen. Verse 24, look what it says. Though they stumble, the ones he's delighting in, though they stumble, they will what? For the Lord holds them by the hand. 
You may stumble. You may, may have been stumbling and stumbled through your parent, parenting with your kids. But listen, I got, got good news for you. The Lord holds you up by his hand. Amen. Hallelujah. I'm trying to bring confidence to you. Listen, you got to release your errors. we got to release our errors sometime, right? Even as sad as it is. But we're, we're, we have children to raise children, to raise our children to become, to become kingdom influencers, to be leavened in the world, to, to be infused into a system of darkness that can bring light in the midst of that darkness and transform the world. That's called the kingdom of God. That's why he, said, that's why he told Adam. See, see uh, the garden was, we, we think, Adam, you know, the whole earth, this whole earth thing uh, that, that just happened and, and it was just there. Adam had to take his, his place in that area and they began to spread Eden out everywhere he went it was more than just God just creating all this stuff and saying Adam okay th this whole world is yours yes it was he gave him Eden he put him in a place he put him in an area it was an, an area he said listen I want you to be fruitful and multiply and I want you to take this area this Eden this kingdom authority and the stuff that I've given you and begin to go out throughout the earth and make it what it should be Am I making sense to you? See, the thing is, if we don't, if, we, if we're not, our kids are to be launched. That way, God can use them to bring his influence into the world. And I've told you time and time again, we are not to insulate. We are not to isolate our children from the world. We're to insulate them. I'm glad there was a Jared Bells and there was a, a Kayleen Jordan there on Friday night. How about you? I'm glad that happened, right? I'm glad that they were there in that moment. See, that's the deal, is that there's crises going to happen all the time. And it's the kingdom people that step into the crisis. Right? That's what we are called to do. We're to step into the crisis. We're called to be firemen. We don't run from fires, we run to them. While everybody else is running out, we're running too. That's our call. Amen. You say, well, I don't know. Man, I've messed up a lot. Let me just show you this guy. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. Look at this. Or my, my, I didn't have a father or this, that, and the other. When I call to remembrance, this is Apostle Paul talking to young Timothy. When I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I'm persuaded it's in you also. There's no mention of Timothy's dad. Because Acts, over in Acts, it says he was a Greek. Highly likely that Timothy's dad wasn't a believer. Are you hearing what I'm saying? See, you can have, you can have not so favorable circumstances, but God will turn it around. God will bring influence. Amen. Amen. So as I begin to raise my kids, right, I need, I need that perfect love cast out what? All oh, fear. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him. He'll, he's going to direct your paths. He's the one that's going to do that. Amen. Perfect love cast out fear. They are his kids. I want you to know that. Your kids, don't. they are on loan to you. They are on loan to me. Right? So again, I tell you, if he saw you fit to, to be a parent, listen, you must have it in you to do it. He must believe in you, and it's his kids. He's going to make sure of that. So have confidence in it. So how do I navigate in this advisory season? How do I navigate in this advisory season, this eight, 18 plus? Okay? This, you're going to always be a parent. Just the way that you parent is going to be different. So how... How do we navigate when we step into this season? Number one, don't stay big. Don't stay big. Our kids need us to become smaller and smaller and smaller in their lives, not bigger, 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 and bigger. Amen. It's a waning season. It's a, listen, the way that you're going to treat an 18, 19-year-old is going to be different than how you're going to treat your 40-year-old. But there's a weaning process. But listen, you've got to become less and less and less. That's our job. 
See, I have saw this before in counseling. One of the things we do in premarital readiness counseling, we we'll spend six weeks with a couple that's going to get married. Uh, the one thing we talk about is the in-laws and the outlaws. That's what, we, that's what I call the in-laws and the outlaws. And we talk about your in-laws. We talk about, okay, you know, what is it? What's the good? Oh, yeah, I hear it. Don't worry. <laughs> what, what's the good thing that you want? What's the good thing you, you saw in your in-laws or your soon-to-be in-laws? Well, what's the bad things you, you see that you don't want to repeat in your, and it's, it's really good. <laughs> but one of the things we talk about is interference. Parental interference inside of a marriage. Listen, you don't belong in your, in your, you do not belong in your kid's marriage. Okay? You don't belong there. You don't belong there. You don't. Now, listen, there's a lot, there's people, and, and you see this a lot. Now, this is, this, this, just hear, hear my heart, hear my heart. Whenever that's, say, whenever that's being said before something, you got to get ready, all right? Because hear my heart, hear my heart. You see this a lot with women and their mothers. You see it. More. And you can become very enmeshed in your relationships with your children that, that it's not healthy at all. You know, the Bible says that a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. There is a leaving and there's a cleaving that happens. There's a severing that happens and a cleaving that happens. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't, you know, I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. It's, there's healthy ways to do this. But you, it's very important that you and I and me, as I become into that, I'll go into that season too, is that we are becoming less and less. When our kids come on the scene, we become less and less. John the Baptist said that. He knew his job. John, John the Baptist said uh, he must become greater and greater, and I must become what? Less and less. So when your kids emerge on the scene, and it's their time to shine, it's up to me to fade to black and let them have center stage. Amen. Amen. We, in this, don't say big. Just relinquishing control. We don't in this season. You don't micromanage your kids' lives. Did you get up on time? Now I'm being serious. I mean, they're living at home with you right now, and you're still waking them. And you're still waking them up. Why? Why did you buy that? <laughs> right. Our children need to learn to be dependent on the Lord, not us. Magnifying the Lord, not us. So coming to the rescue of our children in this stage is making them dependent on you, not the Lord. Number two, offer help and ask, not enablement. Okay? Offering help, offer help and ask, not enablement. Remember now, what's this season called? It's called the what? The advisory season. It's an advisory season. Again, it's a weaning process. But again, don't just jump in the mix. Your children hopefully will be asking your advice. Hopefully. Uh, let's hope. They ask. Listen, if they're not, they're foolish. No, the Bible says it. If we're not seeking counsel, then we're fools. That's what the Bible says. And a multitude of counselors, their safety. Now listen, if you're in the coaching season or the training season, you're working towards this phase. And what's going on in these two seasons... It's actually helping you develop a relationship. That way when it, things start to shift over here in this advisory season, they're going to run to you for, for, for help. But see, if you're, like, uh, you know, if you're like Hilda and you're just barking orders all the time in the coaching season and all the time just, whoa, 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 whoa. It's like a dog. You know what I mean? Just, whoa, 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 whoa. And that's all you do. Listen, forget them ever asking you about anything because why? They're going to say, you know what? All they're going to do is bark at me anyway. Now, we don't, listen, we want our kids, we, we need to be teaching our kids, even in the coaching seasons, in the, in the training seasons, to listen to people. Let, let me show you, again, we're going to kind of shift gears just a minute here. I want to show you something from 1 Kings and show you this, 
this kind of this principle about our kids and they need to be listening to us and they need to seek us out. It's, it's true. It says, in the seventh year of Jehu, Johash became king and, uh, and he reigned 40 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was, uh, it's, I think it's 1 Kings 18. I think I maybe gave you, let me just look here real quick. Let me make sure I got it. It's 1 Kings chapter 12. 1 Kings chapter 12. You can find it there real quick. 1 Kings chapter 12, verse 1. We're going to read here in these scriptures. And Rehoboam, that's where I want to, went to Shechem, for all of Israel had gone to Shechem to make him king. Verse 2. So it happened when Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, heard it, uh, he was still in Egypt, for he had fled from the presence of the king. Solomon had been dwelling in Egypt. Verse 3. And they sent and called him. Then Jeroboam and the whole assembly of Israel came and spoke to Rehoboam, saying, saying, Your father made our yoke heavy. Now, therefore, lighten the burdensome service of your father and his heavy yoke which he put on us, and we will serve you. Verse 5. So he said to them, Depart for three days, then come back to me. And the people departed. Verse 6. Then King Rehoboam consulted the what? That's smart. Consulting the elders. Right? Consulting the elders. Who stood before his father Solomon while he was still alive, and he said, how do, you, how do you advise me to answer these people? Verse 7. And they spoke to him saying, If you will be a servant of these people today, serve them, answer them, and speak good words to them, then they will be your servants forever. Verse 8. But he rejected the advice which the elder had given him, and he consulted the young men who had grown up with him who stood before him. Boy. Oh, boy. Major problems. It caused major issues. Now, our kids are going to have a choice. And sometimes they're going to listen to their buddies and not you. I'm not telling you to say, I told you so, but maybe you guys say, I told you so. Right? Man, your children hope to be asking you for advice. All right? That's what we want. We want our kids to come. You have experience. And it's vital in this season we're advising our children when they ask. Share your wisdom and insight without being critical. Amen. If you want your kids in this season, no matter if they're uh, 18 or they're 30, listen, it's best for you and I to understand and learn how to do this right. Don't be critical of them. Hard, listen, soft answers turns away wrath. Amen. We need to understand this. We need to, they need to be seeking counsel. If any man lacks wisdom, let him what? Ask of God. Even God doesn't get involved until somebody asks him. So how much more in this season us becoming less and less and less and us helping when they, and, and giving them advice in this season and not enabling them? Now see, this is the problem. Because a lot of people, they enable their kids. And enablement creates an atmosphere for our adult children to comfortably continue, continue their unacceptable behaviors. So helping is different than enabling. Amen? Now, stuff like this. Let me just help you. Uh, repeatedly loaning money with, which seldom gets repaid. That's enabling them. Now, if they come to you and say, Mom, I'm struggling. I need some help. That's a different story. Right? But, but just in this season, if you don't watch out, you enable them. Uh, uh, paying bills repeatedly that, that was to be paid themselves. Oh, I'll pay it for you, honey. Don't worry. Listen, if they don't have the money, they shouldn't have bought it. Now again, if we're continually rescuing our children all the time, how are they ever going to learn? Right? I'm not saying it's easy. I'm just saying this is the way it happens. Have you accepted part of the blame for inappropriate behaviors? Oh, honey, I'm sorry. I, I'm to blame for all. I'm, I'm, I was a terrible mom. And... Hold on. There's many people that have had not stellar past parents that's not been good. And they've made right decisions. Making right decisions is making right decisions. 
don't enable them to make wrong decisions. Oh, yeah, how about this? We're going to threaten to do certain things without no follow through. Again, just not enabling. It's important that I help them. I want to help them, right? But just parents all the time jumping into their kids' business, uh, you're going to find them all the time. Amen. Let them make mistakes. Don't bail. Let them fail. Life experiences are important. Amen. So number one, it's what? It's don't stay big. Number two, offer help when asked, not enablement. Number three, love unconditionally. Our children are going to make mistakes. Our kids are going to make mistakes. Even our adult kids are going to make mistakes. And they will disappoint us at times. Right? I don't think there's any parent in this room that said, I've never been just disappointed in the way that something's happened. Right? Disappointment. And they're going to make decisions that, that, that don't light up with your values or convictions. I mean, come on, think about this. How, how about a parent that their son or daughter comes home and tells them that they're gay? Right? That's, that, is a, that is a real life situation. Are you with me? How are you going to, you're going to love them. They're still your kids. Well, if you want to get real religious about it, next thing you know, you, you'll kick them out and say, I'm never going to talk to you ever again. Is that really going to solve the issue? It's a heart problem anyway. Trying to correct behaviors when there's heart issues is a different story. You can't just, you can't delegate or legislate or tell them you've got to act a certain way. They're going to go and act the way that you're saying not to. It's a heart issue. Now, these are touchy subjects. I get that. What about the son or the daughter that's addicted to a drug or to meth or whatever? Right? I mean, this is, a, this, is a, this is a thing that happens all the time in our community. What do we do? we got to learn to love unconditionally. Love unconditionally. Amen. Love is about, listen, and listen, let me tell you this too. Let me say this without saying I'm, I'm thinking I'm just soft. Here. Love has boundaries also. So there's a balance to this. It's not like we can go over here in the left field. we got to bring this back to center. Love does have boundaries. Right? I mean, I've used this illustration before. I use it in counseling. I use it, I've, I've said it here before. But if, 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 if you were thirsty, if you were thirsty and, and, and I said, well, I have a bottle of water, but I know there's some type of poison in this, but you need something to drink, and I give that to you and don't tell you, is that love or is that hate? That's hate. I mean, if you're driving on the wrong side of the road and you guys are having a great time talking, but I never tell you to get on. Listen, you're on the wrong side of the road. Well, I didn't want to offend you. I didn't really want to offend you. I know you're real thirsty. I didn't want to offend you. No, listen, love has boundaries to it. And this season, you've got to learn to have, I mean, Sheila probably could talk to this, or, uh, you know, there's, you have to sometimes, man, have, there's tough love sometimes. Amen. See, love, see, let me tell you this, love is a commitment, church. Loving isn't about a feeling. Marriages, this is why marriages go, people say, well, I don't love him anymore. That's a crock. I'm sorry. And it's just, it's, it's what it is. Because love is never about a feeling. Love is about a commitment. The greatest act of love was Jesus on a cross. Do you think that felt good? No, but it was commitment. See, that's the thing, is that my love for my kids, I have a commitment to them. It's not about what I feel. Come on, somebody. Are you guys with me here? God's love is in you. It's in you. Amen. Amen. I mean, you reviewing all the time, and you just write this for your notes. You need to review 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8, on a regular basis. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love, love keeps no record of wrongs. Love, love, you know, love always believes. God loves, God, God's love always hopes. Right? I mean, I mean that's, we, have to, we have to get that in us. Because that's how we're going to deal in our relationships. You, listen, you can never lose sight of who your kids, who your who 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 your kids are, really, who they are, not what they're doing, but what their destiny is. I want to show you this picture real quick, and, and, and this picture here is 
is, is by Michael, Michelangelo is one of his most famous, uh, he's one of the most famous sculptors, Michelangelo, and, and, and this was one of his most famous pieces. And listen to this story. The splendid statue of an angel holding a decorative candlestick is a masterpiece of the renowned sculptor Michelangelo. He, ca- he carved it out of a block of marble to decorate the tomb of St. Dominic at Bologna, Bologna in Italy. Later he was asked how he could make the marvelous model from a shapeless stone. The gifted sculptor replied, I saw the angel in the marble and I carved until I set him free. In his opinion, every block of stone has a statue statue inside it and it is the task of the sculptor to discover it. He added by saying, in every block of marble, I see a statue as plain as though it stood before me, shaped and perfect in attitude and action. I have only to hew away the rough walls that imprison the lovely apparition to reveal it to to others' eyes as mine see it. That's power. You and I, it doesn't matter if it's with our kids or with anybody. You and I can never lose sight of, 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 of the angel that's in the marble. You can never, you and I can always have to know, listen, because why? We need, that's, that's what we need to be praying, church. God, give me eyes to see like you. It's a prayer of all the time. Lord, I want to love like you would love. I want to see as you would see. I want to hear as you would hear. I want, to, I want to reach like you would reach. I want to walk like you would walk. What am I trying to do? I'm saying, Lord, I need your perspective because there's something that needs to be, something needs to be carved out in people's lives. In this season of advisory roles, you and I, we, we need to, to love unconditionally and never lose sight of the destiny and the purpose that's before our kids. Always. Amen. We don't lose sight. We're still their biggest fans. We've moved from the coach to now the spectator. We're now in the stands. See, we were once on the field. We've now off the field, the sidelines, and now we've moved to the place of a spectator. But you know, even a spectator will have a good point every now and then. But you also can be a spectator and think you know it all. armchair quarterbacks. But listen, but sometimes a spectator will have a view that even the coach didn't see it. Right? Huh? So this is your role. In this season of life, this is your role. It's, it's, to, it's to move to the place of, of, of loving unconditionally. Not that you're, you're always going to do that, but in this season, we have to love unconditionally because your kids are sometimes going to make decisions and choices that don't line up with what you think is right. Amen. Amen. Speaking life over them, blessing them, being their biggest fan. Number four, stay connected. Stay connected. This season is a transition from t- to friendship. This is, this is where things begin to shift, and it moves more like a friend. It moves to more friendship. You're not barking out orders, coaching and training. Now you're a friend. You'll find they're becoming more like your peers. Amen. You like to hang out with them and they come over and stay connected with phone calls and text messages and stay connected with family gatherings. It's important. But again, know what your role is. Stay connected. Number five, be a parent to praise. This is what you do in this season. You're going to pray. Our children do not cease in being our children. There's always an awareness in our hearts about our kids. There's always. And it's never going to leave. You're, they're always going to have an awareness about your kids. But one thing that we can do, you may not be so involved, but you can pray. Be a parent that prays. And the sixth thing in this season, all right? This is, this is, this is a good season. Listen, you know, for all of you guys that are coaching and training and that season of life, don't lose, don't lose your spouse in the middle of that. Because one day all those kids are going to leave. And it's just going to be you. Hallelujah. Joe Bailey says, Hallelujah. <laughs> Woo! I felt that. <laughs> no, they're going to leave. 
And if you don't watch out, you're going to look at your spouse and who are you? Me and Annie made that commitment. We're never going to lose each other. We're never going to lose each other. Never. We made that commitment before we ever had kids. We will not lose each other. In the middle of the process, we won't lose each other. Don't make your, listen, don't make your home in the coaching and training season a child-centric home. Don't make it child-centric. If you do, you're going to have problems in this season right here. This is the sixth thing. It's in this season that you refocus, reload, and refire. It's time you refocus some things, right? I mean, take the vacation by yourself, right? Take the vacation. No kids around. Go on the cruise and be able to go to the, not, not, the, not the party deck, but go, what's that, what's that, what's that deck called, huh? The serenity deck. <laughs> I will say this. Someone had me convinced that the serenity deck was the naked, the, the naked part of the deck. <laughs> Whoa! No, that's not where we're going. But I found out for the serenity deck was where the old people hang out. And everybody had their shirt on and their skivvies on. <laughs> Refocus. Maybe you need to refocus in this season back on your marriage again. Uh, uh, reloading yourself. Where is it? Especially for mommies, you know, they get so, and they're so involved, and you need to be so involved that, that now this is a season your kids are gone. What is it God, God, that God's calling you to now? What, what new season now are you in? What new, what's God wanting to do for you now in this season? See, this is important in this advisory season that you and I understand how to navigate through it. If not, when your kids leave, you'll go into a major depression. What am I going to do now? My life's ended. No, it's just starting for you. Amen. Now, <clears throat> there's a few things to help you out. Now, I want to do this real quick. Let's talk in this season, sometimes our kids, and we'll use the word prodigal, um, they, they, they go away from the Lord. It's a, true, it's a true statement. It happens. And there's some things I want to deal with. What do you do in this season that if our kids become prodigal? Okay? There's four myths real quick. Let me just give these to you. I just, I'm just talking to you today. Four myths about this season, a prodigal season. If your kids are in a prodigal season, these are myths. Perfect parenting makes perfect children. That's a myth. You know what? There's no perfect parents. There's no perfect children. Even the greatest parents will have kids that will go astray. Okay? That's a myth. Number two, it's all my fault. It's all my fault. You know, guilt is a killer. Stop beating yourself up. Amen. If there's something to change, then do it. If there's something you need to ask forgiveness, go to ask for forgiveness. If there's something you can do, go get it right. But if not, you got to let it go. They're responsible for their own decisions. There's no crutch. There's no blame there for why they're doing what they're doing. Quit doing that. Listen, they're, 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 they're adults. They can make decisions on their own. And quit looking at yourself and thinking, what? if not, you, when you've released your head, you'll be thinking about every type of misstep that you've ever made. Let, your, let the guilt, listen, there's no condemnation in Christ. None. Let it go. There's no perfect parent anyway. We all make mistakes. Number three, I can rescue them. I can rescue them. No, you can't. But God can. Get them in the hands of God and get, out, and get out of the way. It's their responsibility to let God rescue them, not you. Number four, God has left us. This is a myth. God's left me. God is nowhere to be found. Hmm. Isn't it amazing when we go through storms, that's the first thing we say, God, where are you? Isn't it amazing the disciples did the same thing? They were in the boat, they were sinking, and it says, don't you care that we are perishing? That's what we do. God's left us. No, he's never left you. Amen. God knows parental pain. Let me show you this. Isaiah, look what it says here in Isaiah 1. Look at this. Listen, O heavens, pay attention, earth. This is what the Lord says. The children I raised and cared for have rebelled against me. 
Even an ox knows its owner and a donkey recognizes its master's care. But Israel doesn't know its master. My people don't recognize my care for them. God knows parental pain. He knows parental pain. God has children every day that disobey him, that walk away from him every day, from his instructions every day. He knows. So but listen, God loves your kids. He loves your adult children. You've got to be reminded, all things are working together for my good. God is seeking your adult children. Amen. He loves them. He gave them to you in the first place. Amen. It, they came from him. So guess what? He pursues them. He loves them. Amen. If you don't watch out, fear will drive you and I to unhealthy places, unhealthy responses. It will cause relationship tension, all because of fear. Amen. So those are four myths. Just real quick. Now, how do I reach a lost child? Let's just think about this a second. In, in Luke chapter, well, actually, I'll tell you what. I'll leave this up. I actually, yeah, let's read it. I think we need to read it. Luke 15. Uh, this is the story of the, the prodigal father. Remember that message I preached? It's the prodigal father, the wasteful, extravagant love of the father. We call it the prodigal son, um, but there's a lot there that we could say it otherwise. But then he said, a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided them his livelihood. Verse 13. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living, wasteful living. When he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Verse 15. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would gladly have filled the stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. Verse 17. But when he came to himself... He said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. He rose and came to his father, but when he was still a great way off, his father saw him, had compassion, ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and no, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servant, Bring out the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. And bring the fat of calf here and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. Verse 24, For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and found, and they began to be merry. Let's look at this real quick here. How do I reach a prodigal? How do I reach a lost child? Number one, you pursue them in prayer. The father did not pursue him. He did not physically pursue him. But I'll guarantee you, he spiritually pursued him through prayer. See, you can still pursue your child. Though you're not pursuing them physically, you can pursue them in prayer. Amen. Amen. The father didn't chase him. Didn't chase him down. Man, this is where spiritual warfare comes in. Who's the one blinding their eyes anyway? The enemy. Right? Spiritual warfare, declaring promises over their life. Seeing that picture, seeing the angel, seeing the, the, the destiny, seeing the purpose and declaring that. That's the power of declaring the decree and declare the purposes of God over your children. Even when they're 28, 29, 35, 45, 55, declaring the promises of God over your kids. Pursue them in prayer. Number two, this is really good. Develop, this is for any season, but especially this, develop short-term paid tolerance for long-term purpose. Develop short-term pain tolerance for long-term purpose. This son that we read about had to experience the pain in order to get him moving in the right direction. Sometimes that's just the way that it goes. The brokenness is what led his son back. The father knew it was a heart issue. He could have said, I'm not giving you this, and no, we're not doing it, and you are going to stay here, and you're going to take out the trash too. <laughs> right? No, no, he knew it was a heart issue. Controlling behaviors wasn't the answer. 
So the father in his love, in his love, he what? He let him go. See, if you don't watch out, it will drag you down with it. Where we start to be unhealthy in our reactions and behaviors. So we got to turn our pain into prayer. Trusting God with your kids. Even at 45. Even at 35. Even at 25. Trusting God with your kids. Turn your pain. Short-term pain tolerance for long-term purpose. Turn your pain into prayer. Number three, unending patience. Unending patience. Verse 20, look what it says in verse 20. Real quick again. I'm almost done here. Then he arose and came to his father. And when he was still a great way, what? off. Now, I know he saw him at a distance. But listen, I, I want to spiritualize this a little bit. I believe he saw him a great way off. He never lost sight of who his son really was. <clears throat> Even when he was eating pods, swine, the father saw him a great ways off. He never lost sight of the angel that was in the marble. Unending patience. Notice what he done. I mean, look at verse 23. <clears throat> look what he's done here. And he, he said, bring the fatted calf. Bring the fatted calf. So he was preparing a calf all along. See, that's someone that has enduring faith. See, patience is enduring faith. That's, that's someone that's enduring and having hope. Listen, you've got to be the most hope-filled parent. Even when your, your child is, is wayward, we need to have hope filled that my child is coming back. Amen. That my child is coming back. Don't be weary in doing good. For in due season, you will reap. Right? If you don't quit. Come on, your kids need you. Those, if you have a wayward son or daughter today, listen, they need you. They need you. They need you. Not to run on the field, but to pray for them. Unending patience. And the final thing is this, unconditional love. And we've already talked about it. If you notice, how did it all end? How did this beautiful scenario, this, this tragedy of, of this respect between the son and the father, it was so disrespectful, he basically said, I want you dead. Give me my inheritance. I want you dead. That's what he was really, that's what he really I, 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 I wish that you were dead. That's really what it comes down to. I wish that you were dead. Now give me what belongs to me. Selfishness. The height of selfishness. <laughs> but, but this father, th this father had compassion on him and ran to him. Amen. And that abundance of love and forgiveness. Notice, he welcomed him back and never asked any questions. Never asked a question. Never said, where you been? Never said, I told you so. I'm learning. Never said, you know what, I knew this was going to happen to you. Don't you understand? If you'd listen to me, you know what, it would never happen to you. You know what, you're going to sleep outside for the next three days. I'm going to tell you one thing. No? Uh-uh. No, he never asked a question. The son took responsibility. He took responsibility for himself. Father never asked a question. He said he welcomed him back. And not only that, he didn't say, you know what? He just wanted to become like one of the servants. That's what the boy wanted. All he cared about was eating. But the father saw something deeper. He said, I'll feed you. That's good. But you ain't working outside with the servant. As a servant. Because mm -mm, that's not who you are. You're a son. I saw you afar away. I never lost sight of you. I never lost sight of the angel and the marble. And you know what? Put the ring back on his finger. Put the robe back on him. Put some sandal on his feet. And let's have a party. Because my son, which was lost, 
is now found. That's how we deal with prodigals. Unconditional love, unending patience. Understand short-term pain tolerance for long-term purpose. Sometimes they have to experience the pain of their decisions. Yeah. Got to do that sometimes. But pursue them in prayer. That's the most important thing you do for your kids. Pray for them. Well, I guess it's, I can, I could pray. I guess I can pray for them. Well, I don't know what else to do but pray. Uh, that's really the wrong thing. It is the thing we do. We do pray. Right? Amen. So it's in the advisory season. Hope that helped you out. You guys are great parents. You really are. You've got strong, strong families in this church. I hope this last four or five, this last five weeks, six weeks actually with Joe here has helped you guys. And our families will be stronger for it. Amen. And, uh, we're winning, amen? I said, we're winning. And we're going to win, amen? And no matter what, no matter where your kids are at, listen, just keep, keep right on at it. Amen. Praise God. Let's, uh, let's pray. Let's play some. Let's pray and let's... Uh... Father, thank you for the opportunity today to be able to come and to this church. Lord, I'm thankful that we can gather together as brothers and sisters in Christ. We can be trained. We can be equipped. I thank you for it, Lord. Lord, I pray that we would never, ever lose sight of the importance of community, the gathering of the saints. Whether that, Lord, would be here in this church on a weekly basis or Lord, in small groups, in our journey groups, or Lord, outside as people go out to eat together or just meet in their homes just for impromptu gatherings. Lord, whatever it is, we'll never lose sight of community and how important it is. Father, today I I thank you that uh, our families are strong. I thank you, God, for the insight and the wisdom that has come forth over the the last weeks, God. Father, that we uh, we would cherish the season we're in that will cherish the season we're in. It's just a season. Seasons come and seasons go. It's not going to always be like this. We're going to advance through the seasons. Our children are going to be launched. And I pray, God, that uh, as we launch our kids, I, we trust you. We do trust you. And the things that we've instilled into them, the things that we have taught them over the years, the, the training, the coaching, It will come out in the end. It will come out in the end. It will come out. Just like we we saw with Kayleen or Jared, many others. I have saw it in many other kids too, Lord. The the things that's been in them, when the squeeze comes on, it comes out. I thank you, God, today that no matter what season we're in, there's a grace for it. It's a grace for the training season. It's a grace for the coaching season. It's a grace in this advisory season. Lord, I I pray that we would all cherish the moments we have with our children. Thank you, God, our homes, our greenhouses, places for our kids and our families and our marriages to flourish and prosper. No matter what's going on outside, no matter the temperature outside, no matter the the, the, the conditions outside our home when we step into our home it's a greenhouse it, it's, it's a climate that doesn't change it's a, it's, a, it's a climate that we can grow fruit 24 hours a day 7 days a week 365 days out of the year it's always harvest time there's always a time of fruit bearing in our homes Holy Spirit you're the one that's the leader of our homes you're the one that your fruit the fruit of the Spirit is in our homes that love and joy and peace and patience and goodness and kindness and gentleness, self-control. Lord, I thank you so much for the for our homes, our marriages are strong. Our kids, Lord God, are thriving, not just not surviving. We're not survivors, we're thrivers. <laughs> we, we don't just survive, we thrive. Our homes are thriving in this environment we 
in our culture, our homes are, are, are thriving. We're living. It's, it's life. Life's in it. Thank you for our homes, God. And I pray, God, every parent in this room will be encouraged and be strengthened. And we give you the praise for all that you do. Thank you for wisdom, Lord. If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God. Lord, we ask for your wisdom. And no matter what season we're in, we're needing your wisdom. It's by wisdom a house is built. By wisdom a house is built. So God, today, I'm praying we draw upon your wisdom. We ask you, Holy Spirit, to lead us in our homes individually. That we're not talking about cookie-cutter parenting. But we are talking about a framework. But how that picture and that painting looks inside the framework is going to be different for everybody in this room. Holy Spirit, help us as we paint. Help us with our strokes. Help us to be able to paint the beautiful picture that you have for our families. Matter of fact, Lord, you take the pencil. You take the pen. You take the brush. And you lead us and you guide us. And we thank you for it now. In Jesus' name.